Hi everyone, today I'm gonna to talk about mainstream press and Bitcoin, why they keep getting it wrong and why they've been so off the mark for the 10 years I've been in the space. But before we begin, I wanna give a shout out to Ledin. Ledin is one of my sponsors. They're one of the best places to borrow against your Bitcoin using your Bitcoin as collateral, so if you need a US dollar loan, or you can lend it out in order to yield. Okay, great, with that being said, let's go ahead and dive on in into the article. So I first post this by the way, on my newsletter. My newsletter is The Held Report, and the link is included below. On The Held Report, I publish this on Thursdays, so if you wanna read this first, get it on Thursdays, you need to subscribe below. If not, you'll hear about it here on Sundays. Okay, cool, so a little bit of background here. Over the last 10 years in this space, I've seen like crazy amounts of journalists reporting totally inaccurate or false information about Bitcoin. They've said things like Bitcoin is dead, or that Bitcoin can be counterfeited, or that Bitcoin's encryption was hacked. These are all false and objectively wrong. If they just had Googled it, they would have found out why. Um, or if they had just Googled it, they would have figured out that this was wrong. There's this really cool image that I like, which is a, a series of little plots or articles or the little red dots of uh, different uh, either not notable Bitcoin skeptics or journalists um, saying that Bitcoin is dead. So you can, uh, you can mouse hover here and see all these uh, morons essentially say that Bitcoin is dead or Bitcoin is worthless. So um, <laughs> pretty pretty funny to see this, and obviously they were all wrong. And we started to see this, I think, decrease a bit in the in the in, in current years because you look kind of like an idiot when you say that. And at first I gave them, them, being the journalist, the benefit of the doubt. Bitcoin requires an in-depth knowledge of both technology and finance, but I realized there was something much more deep they're really entrenched in the mainstream establishment. So like the media and universities and politicians and big corporations are all sort of intertwined. As we saw in the 2016 election, these media companies quickly turned to trusted third parties to validate the perspective that Russia had hacked the election. Now they didn't use first principles thinking though, and here's a good, re here's a, here's a good call out. My profession is growth marketing. Growth marketing's entire purpose is to use organic and paid methodology. So organic is when you don't pay for it, paid is where you pay like Facebook or another ad platform to acquire new customers or change opinions about products, to change opinions about products like Kraken or Uber. These are companies I've worked for. Um, never once did I see a journalist interview someone from the marketing profession about the election hacking. But in order to pull something like the election hack off, these Russian hackers would have, would to have they would have would have been the best marketers in the world. Well, they're not. <laughs> Pro tip: they're not. And there's all sorts of other factual inaccuracies where if you had used a basic first principles mindset instead of going to the intelligence, uh, you know, the CIA, NSA, and allowing them to be manipulated by these agencies, if they just used first principles thinking, you could have easily debunked some of these narratives. Here's another one. So this is from The Guardian. Facebook said on Wednesday it had found an influence operation, probably based in Russia, uh, which had spent $100,000 in ads. Okay, so they use that as evidence that there is meddling in the election. But let me give you some context here. A few billion dollars a day are spent on advertising in the U.S. alone. And in the 2016 election, Hillary spent $1.4 billion on her campaign. Most of that, or much of that, on ads or marketing. <laughs> so you're telling me that $100,000 in ads could influence an election, but not 1.4 billion? Furthermore, and by the way, here's a here's a chart that shows how much Hillary raised versus Trump. Trump raised 957 million, she raised 1.4 billion. And so when we look at, um, you know, when we look at how, how many, you know, how many different publications endorsed Trump too, so like how many newspapers or magazines or TV channels endorse Trump? Very, very few. Um, and so this is pretty wild. When we look at how many newspapers or like other mainstream publications endorse Trump in the 2016 election, just look at this. I mean, it's almost all Hillary Clinton, who's blue, not Donald Trump, is purple, and you've got no endorsements. We're scrolling. Oh, here's the first one. Santa Barbara News Press. That's the first one that endorses Trump. Basically, that means that this publication comes out and says that we like this candidate, which I don't know how that is considered neutral journalism. And as you can see, as we keep scrolling here, this is the Wikipedia page for it. And we keep scrolling and we keep scrolling. Oh, here's a few more. The St. Joseph News Press, the Waxahachie Daily Light. Very, very big publications, of course. All sarcasm intended. 
as you can see, there are extremely few publications that endorsed Donald Trump. So you're telling me that Donald Trump, who wasn't endorsed by any of the mainstream publications, that somehow a couple hundred thousand dollars or 50,000 Twitter bots were able to overcome every single journal, <laughs> every single publication rooting for Hillary Clinton? I, I find that pretty improbable. And so why do I bring this up? Why am I going on this rant about the Russia election and mainstream press? Well, we see this pattern happening in the Bitcoin crypto space as well. These journalists choose to craft their own narrative, regardless of facts, regardless of the truth around Bitcoin. And below, I'll, I'll, I'm going to call out some facepalm moments and then wrap up with why this, you know, after watching this, what you should do given your new perspective or your new distrust of mainstream journalism and just be in this distrust doesn't come from a, a place of dishonesty. You're just simply asking them to report the truth. And it's very easy to go look at this and, and be like, this isn't the truth. Before we begin, I want to give a shout out to Choice, one of my sponsors. As most of you know, when you hodl, you don't have to pay taxes. But what if I told you that you could hodl and when you eventually sell your Bitcoin, you wouldn't have to pay any taxes then? Well, I didn't think that was possible until I found a Choice IRA. Choice is the best retirement account to set up for Bitcoiners that lets you buy and hold Bitcoin in stocks without paying a dime to the government. And how does that work? Choice is an IRA. They have IRAs and Roth IRAs, which means it's a special type of retirement account where you don't pay taxes if you hodl until a certain age, along with some other stipulations. And the best part, you can self-custody your Bitcoin with Choice, which means that you don't have to trust Choice or anyone else with your Bitcoin or your private keys. It's the perfect retirement solution for Bitcoiners. The best time to start stacking sats was 11 years ago. The second best time is today. Search stack sats in the app store or choiceapp.io slash held. Link is included in the description below. Go get, check it out right now. So here's some common face palm moments of the journalist in the crypto space. So there's a common narrative that they have where they say that we are objective. We are staying truth seeking by not trying out Bitcoin or crypto. So that's kind of weird. I mean, I don't really know how you understand it if you never tried it. But uh, here's a good here's a good sort of um, back and forth here. So. Um, so I ask a journalist who's been in this space almost 10 years, wait, so you never bought Bitcoin? His my name is Michael D. Castillo. Michael says no, not until I'm not covering it or it's no longer considered a speculative asset, but a currency. Okay. And then Pete Rizzo, a former journalist, says following this logic, well, who decides that for you? You know, who decides when it becomes speculative or not speculative? And so they go through this as well. And uh, part of this, there's a there's a whole con there's a whole stream of of back and forth arguments. But this one, I think, really highlights it well, where if they want to be unbiased towards Bitcoin, then they can't own dollars. <laughs> but of course, they don't sell their dollars for euros. So and even if they held euros, they'd still be they would still have a bias. Um, if they own a home, you know, or they own any asset, which of course they own some assets that inherently makes them biased against assets that they don't own. So it's a, it's a, <laughs> as Jameson Law highlights here, oh, then dollars are fine because they continu continually lose value. Um, so it's just really weird mental gymnastics where they set this artificial, instead of publishing the truth or publishing something rational, they instead create these weird sort of purity tests of like, oh, well, I might have misreported on it, but at least I don't hold it. Okay, the whole point is that you report the truth on it. And then when we look at Wired, so Wired lost $100,000 in Bitcoin. So they went through this weird mental gymnastics where they, they tried, they bought this, they had this Bitcoin miner given to them. They used it to mine Bitcoin. And then they were like, well, what do we do with it? What do we do with the money? Says Michael Kalor, a senior editor at, at Wired, who's been at the magazine since 2006. Donate it, they said. Um, or, or maybe use it. <laughs> And then so instead of donating it, they decided to destroy the Bitcoin, <laughs> which is super weird, um, super bizarre way to deal with it. But it's just totally nonsensical. And, and most of the journalists I've talked to, I'm not saying they work at Wired, I'm just saying in general that I worked with back in the 2013 era, most of them that I asked don't own Bitcoin, which is just mind numbingly crazy. Um, OK, well, that's enough on that topic. But. Uh, here's a great one. Um, journalists will often say, what we wrote wasn't misinformation. We just either had bad sources or we chose a different metric. Well, the bad sources one, you should understand that your sources could be feeding you false information. You know, they, they when they report stuff and it says, sources say 
That's you. That comes from a source that the journalist has, but they can't verify what a person at the NSA or CIA, CIA says. So when they see sources at the CIA say, say that X, Y, or Z, they have no idea how to validate that. They're just simply publishing it because they were fed that by someone there. And that someone has an agenda. They want to push the narrative a certain way or another. It's not like that leak wasn't intentional. The NSA and CIA plan these leaks. It's completely how they control the narrative. Um, and so if you think about it, like when they look at other things too, like more complicated things like, like data, this one was really, really appalling where um, essentially a new chain analysis report confirms that the illicit use of cryptocurrency is a minuscule part of its overall volume, 0.15%. And then here's what Wall Street Journal reports. Cryptocurrency crime hits new high in value. Pretty dishonest, right? It's not, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty off the mark on what the data said versus what they said. And when we think about the percentage of that money being in illicit, being used in illicit transactions, let's compare that to the U.S. dollar. If your your average twenty and hundred dollar bills, ninety percent of them, on average, have traces of cocaine on them. So, fiat cash is used extensively for this activity. Why aren't those hitting the headlines? Why why is it crypto? Why do they care about that? And so I confronted them about it, the journalist, and I go, well, it's intentionally misleading. And they go, well, oh, it's exactly how the facts are presented in the source material. And I asked, as a journalist, you're comfortable publishing that headline? Don't you think it is all mislead? It is, it is at all misleading? And they said no. I mean, it's com completely absurd. Um, oh, and weaving into that last point that I talked about, where when they talk to different sources, they take those sources at face value. This one too, they, that they think that they publish the truth, that they they fact check that they're, they're ultimate sources of truth. Well. I find this pretty troubling because the idea that journalists who aren't the experts in their respective fields, again, they're the writers, they're the storytellers. The idea that they can somehow analyze massive complex data sets, that they can somehow take every single perspective from the industry and then write about it and that that be truthful is egregious and just super arrogant. Um, and so... You know, for example, like if they report an oil pipeline construction, they don't know any technical, environmental, or business knowledge about the pipeline. They simply understand who works there, what companies are involved, and what the overall narrative is. But they barely understand any tiny f component of this. I mean, these are these are not industry experts, right? They they write stories. They don't they don't develop build they don't build buildings as a civil engineer. They're not a mechanical engineer. They're not a they're not a data scientist. Um, and so, also, what is the truth? What caused A or B? This is extremely difficult to parse out. And companies like Uber and Kraken, we have big data science teams that spend a lot of time looking at, hey, if we change a button color, does that increase the number of people who sign up or go trade? And so, you know, that takes, and then we have to isolate all those variables, look at one variable, change that, and see what the cause and effect was. How would you possibly understand the cause and effect of millions or billions or thousands of participants and you only have a fragment of the data here's a good example the weapons of mass destruction did we ever find those in iraq no we didn't it was a complete fabrication by the intelligence community and by journalists almost every single major publication picked up that story ran with it as if it was truth and almost none of them pushed back on if that information was real because they were given information by the uh the uh you know this is fact checked by the intelligence community okay well you know that's <laughs> it's not really that's not that reassuring um and so what do you do with this information now that you've gotten to this point and you're like okay dan this is kind of scary this is kind of weird well michael creighton a famous author he wrote jurassic park for example coined the term gel man amnesia effect to describe forgetting how unreliable a source is in one area when you start to trust it in another one. So basically what he's saying is like it, with this information that now that you have, you go, okay, whoa. So like journalists really misreport on crypto and Bitcoin. So I probably shouldn't trust what they write there because I know the field better than they do. You're right. That's a good, you, you've gotten to the first step. But the second step is realizing everything else that they write is also wrong too. That's the biggest one. And that's what he's referring to here is a lot of people understand their niche but then they don't extrapolate it to every piece of journalistic uh, content. And so then they'll read something about Ukraine or Russia or um, German manufacturing, whatever it may be, and take it at face value. You have to continually reinforce 
the fact that when you read this, remember that they are not the experts, that they are talking to experts and formulating an opinion, but it is not at all truth. And in fact, it could be very far away from the truth. And so as I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, I discovered this and it changed my perspective on many other things. And so I very much encourage you to verify or use your common sense when reading some of this information. With narratives, why is this narrative propagating? Why, why do I feel this way when I read this content? There's probably someone on the other side who crafted that piece of content, that article, that wanted you to feel a certain way. And there's an agenda behind that. There always is. They aren't just reporting the information. There's a battle of narratives on both sides. Make sure you're not just being kind of thrown around on the surface where you feel this, this, this either sadness, anger, hope, but then realize that there's a narrative being propagated there. But I don't want to end on a too serious of a note. If you want, want to check out a good, if you want to have a good laugh, check out Pessimist Archive, one of my favorite Twitter accounts. They have really funny stuff where, you know, for example, it says like, these are, this is from 1952. So this guy goes and looks at old newspapers and finds like really ridiculous headlines that journalists wrote. Electronic brains may have soon, may soon have little to do. Horse versus automobile. Before you discard your horse and buy an automobile, you may think about the cost. <laughs> Is novel reading a disease? 1915. So Pessimist Archive, I think, does a phenomenal job. Check them out on Twitter. They're uh, at Pessimist Arc. And so with that being said, check them out to have a good laugh. Uh, but also keep your mind focused. Make sure that you don't allow yourself to be swayed by the emotions of these narratives. Someone is behind that and you want to be objective as possible. Hope you enjoyed this. If you like this, give me a like. Also give me a subscription. It helps out with the algorithm. We appreciate you watching. Tune in for next time. Oh, also, if you want to do that, if you want to hear, if you have a Q&A on this, so like if you have any questions about what I just covered, join. There's a link for the call app. I do those on Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So if you want to hop on there, ask me any question you want around this topic, go ahead and join that on Monday. All right, cheers.